All right. I think we should probably get started or could get started. So why not? Um, welcome uh, to the, what is it? June meeting of the Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice System Advisory Panel. Um, can we begin with introductions? I will go down my list this time, perhaps after a year, two years of this, I will get it right. Uh, Chris, could you please introduce yourself? Start us off. Sure. Uh, Christopher Loris, Research Associate with Crime Research Group here observing for Karen and Dr. Joy. And uh, full disclosure, I am also an appointee to the Criminal Justice Council, but I'm not wearing that hat tonight. Great. Thank you. Jen Furpo, hello. Hello, I'm Jen Furpo. I am a training coordinator at the Vermont Criminal Justice Council, and my areas are domestic violence and fair and impartial policing. Great, thanks. Grant Taylor. Grant is our, our he, he, he cannot speak for the moment. <laughs> he is our um, scribe, our secretary in a sense, who is taking all of our notes and um, is just very dedicated to that particular thing. Thank you, Grant. Uh, Jay Green. Um, yes. Um Thank you for welcoming me. I'm Jay Green. Uh, I use they, them pronouns. I'm the racial equity policy and research analyst for the Office of Racial Equity. I am um, partially filling in for Susanna while she is uh, joining a little later in the meeting and also here to introduce myself since it's kind of, uh, it's been about three and a half months since I joined the Depart the Office of Racial Equity. So I thought it was finally time to uh, come to one of <laughs> these meetings. Um, so thank you for having me. Great, thank you. Aaron. Hi, everyone. Aaron Jacobson, she, her. I am the co-director of the Community Justice Division at the Attorney General's Office. Thank you. Jennifer Pullman. Hi, I'm Jennifer Pullman. I'm the executive uh, director of the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services, and I'm grateful to be here and in the company of so many amazing people and um, just trying to figure out how the center can be a part of this conversation moving things forward. So thank you. Thanks. Jessica. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jessica Brown. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I am an attorney general's office appointee from the community to the racial disparities panel. And I am an assistant professor of criminal law and the associate director of the Center for Justice Reform at Vermont Law School. Thanks. Elizabeth. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Morris. I am the juvenile justice coordinator um, at DCF. Great. Ching. Hi, I'm Ting Ren. Um, I'm a um, evaluation and program analyst at Shelburne Farms. I'm also a community member on this panel. Great, thank you. Sheila. Hello, everybody. Sheila Linton, she, her, hers, the Root Social Justice Center and appointed by the Attorney General. Julio. Hi, I'm Julio Thompson. I'm a member at large here to watch, but I'm also a uh, director of civil rights at the attorney general's office. Thank you, Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Uh, Rebecca Turner at the defender general's office. Thank you, Monica. You're muted. Okay. Well, while you're figuring it out, let me go. To, 
Judge Zone. Good evening, Tom Zone, Chief Superior Judge. I get the sense that Monica may have caught whatever Grant has for the muting there. I don't know. <laughs> it, could be, it could be a computer virus. We have to be careful. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm really paranoid about viruses at this point in history. Yeah, um, Monica, are you? Are you? I'll try. Can you hear me now? Oh, there you are. I have a new computer, and I'm figuring <laughs> out all the different settings I have to adjust. So sorry about that. Anyway, I'm Monica Weber. She, her. I am with the Department of Corrections. Great. Thank you all, and that is everyone that I have on my list. Have I forgotten anyone? Speak now, or you know how it goes. Um, Evan Meenan with the Department of State's Attorneys. Yep, well, screwed it up. Knew that would happen. Uh, <laughs> Hi, Evan. I even said hello to you earlier. Anybody else? Uh, name's Weche Arto, pronouncing him his uh, data warehouse and social uh, expert and social justice advocate. Thank you, Weche. Anybody else? Clearly, I need to work on this. No. All right. Um, let me start out with a few announcements. Um, no, no, no. Actually, I'm going to just use my prerogative, switch things around. I'd like to start with the approval of the minutes from the April meeting, which I sent to you all. Um, are there comments, suggestions, uh, errors, things to add, anything of that sort? Because Poor Grant has been working on these, and <laughs> I keep giving them back to him going, nope, do this, nope, do this. Um, but I also said to him that uh, any final good comments of things that I might have missed would come from the panel. He's developing a template so that he can just sort of run it for each meeting. Uh, so anything you all can offer, that is obviously going to be different from what I've done um, would be good, but you may think it's fine. So anybody. Monica. Do we have to make a motion first before we have discussion about the minutes? Is that? <laughs> oh, that's right. We do have to do that. Sorry, I totally screwed that up. Can I have so a I motion? Can make, I can make a motion to go for it and I then we'll have, have discussion okay because i did have a comment okay you're making a motion to we need to know what your motion is um well i guess i'd like to make a motion to come up with a different template for the minutes okay second Oh, hell, I'll second it because I want to hear it. <laughs> um, discussion, Monica, I'm assuming. Sure. Um, and, you know, and I appreciate and this is just a question. I'm not really sure we've had this conversation and I'm so I'm just going to put it out there and then I'll just kind of back off of it. Generally, um, in other organizations that I've been a part of where minutes are being taken, they aren't usually um, this detailed. And they usually aren't sort of like by person explicitly what they said. They more capture points of discussion and um, generally and decisions that might have been made by the group. So while I appreciate this as a really good document about what happened at the meeting, um, I feel like that as minutes, they're probably too extensive. Um, and so that's the that's the comment I'm making. OK, others. Thank you. Sheila. So while I appreciate what Monica said, I think there's a yes and to it that for 
those who are sort of depending on this as the modal to receive their information. It allows people to understand a little bit more what was said and maybe with more accuracy, um, allowing for more understanding. And so I think that p different people learn and take in information different ways. And so I really appreciate the work that is done. And I think it's accountability measure. I think that it allows us as those who are in the space and choose to use our voice in the space to one, be checking the minutes and reading them over to make sure they're accurate of what we feel like we've stated. And two, to hold us accountable to what we believe, want to discuss, or have put into the space. So I think that, um, yes, Monica's correct. And um, though that may be the traditional way of doing things, doesn't mean that that has to be the way that we continue to do them. And I do believe in fluidity. So I understand about creating a consistent system and structure, but I also believe that if this is how the note taker wants to take notes now, now and that it can work for the um, majority of us or it can we can come to consensus of what can work for us, great. Um, and if the, a new person comes in and wants to switch it up a little bit, I think we should all be fluid to open, be open to that. Okay, thank you. Ching. Um, I I agree with both Monica and Sheila. This is very, uh, I really appreciate this is really extensive. And actually today I, w I went into one of our minute documents in the past and that's specifically looking for uh, like some quotes from people who said, just not for anything, just for my own memory purposes. So I really appreciate the detailed notes. Um, I do understand there might be you know, places where we want to have some sort of overarching kind of summary of the meetings, but I, I don't really want to lose this sort of detail if that's achievable. And I really appreciate the fact that it's, a, it's organized by, you know, by person, like by the speaker. So that gives me an idea of like when I'm looking back at the, at the notes and I know, okay, so who said this and that was, you know, that, that information is important to me. Okay. okay. Thank you. Anyone? Uh, Evan. So um, I think that I agree with Monica that the minutes are more detailed than I'm used to seeing from other public bodies. But I also agree that um, there's no prohibition on the on the minutes being this detailed. I think that they can generally be as detailed as we would like them to be. But I thought that it might be helpful just to mention what the minimum content of minutes has to be under the law, just to sort of give some perspective. So in the open meetings law, it says, that the minutes shall cover all topics and motions that arise at the meeting and give a true indication of the business of the meeting. So what the heck does that mean, right? And it goes on to say that the minutes have to include the following minimum information. All members of the public body present, all other active participants in the meeting, all motions, proposals, and resolutions made, offered, and considered, and what the disposition of those were, and then the results of any votes with a record of the individual vote of each member if a roll call is taken. So that minimum list is, is pretty bare bones. Um, but again, that's just the the law sets forth what the minimum information is, not not the maximum, to the best of my knowledge, anyway. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Okay, then. Um, oh, Rebecca. Well, just short. I love them. Um, thank you, Grant. Appreciate the detail. It, it almost reads like a transcript, but not. It's shorter than a transcript, and I can. I read those for, as a living. Um, and so I, I, I think, thanks to Evan for reminding us what the minimums are. It sounds like too that under law, it's flexible as to what else you can do besides that. So I am very thrilled and grateful 
Grant, that you're there doing this for us. I don't even know how much you're being paid <laughs> for this work. Um, and I think for transparency purposes, we have Orca here. Our whole reason for being is to make sure we have access and accountability on multiple levels. If we have more detailed minutes than usual in government uh, committee meetings, I say that is a wonderful thing. And I wish that could happen across the board, uh, but we can't. So we have them here. Thank you. I say no change. Okay. Great. Uh, then uh, Monica. Well, I just wanted to thank everyone for the conversation because that's really all I wanted to have was make a comment, and I had to <laughs> make a make a motion to do that. So I'm I'm very happy to withdraw my motion because I understand all the points. I just wanted to be able to have a conversation about the expectation for for the minutes. Great. Does anyone want to make a motion since there don't seem to be any suggestions for changes or anything? I make a motion to accept the minutes as they exist. I can second. Or well, so I didn't moved. actually. So moved. Okay. I'll make the motion. Okay. So great. Thank oh. you. Sheila. And <laughs> I, Evan, guess I'll second. Second. I guess I'll second. I guess I'll second. All in favor accepting the minutes, say aye. 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 All opposed. All abstaining. Motion is carried. We accept the minutes. Thank you, Grant. Um, and I will, um, I'll worry about getting those, Grant, to Ann Walker tomorrow morning, probably, so she can, um, post them on the Attorney General's website. Thank you. All right, now announcements. Does anybody have any that they need to bring forth? I do, but okay. Um, what I wanted to say um, was just sort of in a way, look over where we're going right now, just in terms of our legislative responsibilities. Um, as you'll recall from Act 54 of 2017, or maybe you won't recall, um, but that's our enabling uh, legislation. And the, re the report, such as the one we wrote in 2019, there's one due every biennium. So technically, we have one due at the end of 2021 while well, we did that. We also did one at the end of 2020. Um, we've been like turning them out year after year, frankly, for a bit here. So I am assuming, and no one has corrected me, including in the legislature, that our next report is a year from this coming December, in other words, 18 months from now. Um, and what I'm hoping we're doing with this process of figuring out what we want to look at, what we want to talk about for a future direction, is to put it eventually in that document, which will be for December of 2023. Um, and that I just wanted to put that out there. We probably, and I'm not, I, I can't believe I'm legitimately saying this. We probably could even go to 2024 because we've just been running these damn things through, cranking them out. But now in terms of given what the content was of the report in 2019, we really ought to do this for December of next year. Um, so that, I just wanted to put that out there. I would recommend that again, as I have said before, people take a look at the December 2019 report, December 4th of 2019. If you don't have it, let me know. I've, um, I've certainly sent it out a few times. That doesn't mean you don't have it. And if you don't, I can send it again. Um, take a look at it, get a sense of it. Again, um, look at it in terms of positives and negatives, um, all that sort of work, uh, because we're about to do that again. Well, about 18 months from now. Um, 
Finally, Susanna has asked to go later than she is listed in the minutes. Um, so we're not going to start with the needs of the Office of Racial Equity um, as regards what is now Act 146. Um, we'll, she'll come in later on, as Jay has told us, and we will um, take up her her issues then, in other words, what the RDAP will need to do in facilitating the new division of racial justice statistics, because of course, we do have some responsibilities under that. I also wanted to thank Monica. Um, Monica, you were really wonderful. When things were looking really grim there for a bit with H546, and I had sort of had a moment, let's say, with um, a particular legislative committee um, around the issue of data. And I'm always being quoted as saying, we are not the RDAP that does data. Monica reined it in a little bit and said, I think we're always gonna have to be thinking something about data. And I was very grateful for that. Um, and in fact, it's quite true, I think. And um, a lot of what, Susanna's going to bring up has to do precisely with those issues because that's a data organization and there's stuff we've got to do about it. So anyway, I just want to put that out there. Um, moving on, we're going to have continue the discussion of our future directions. Um, and I'd like to start this evening with the next group on the list, which would be, um, well, Tyler Allen isn't here this evening. He had a family obligation that he had to meet, but Elizabeth's here. And I would like to um, invite her to speak further about juvenile justice. There was another email this afternoon that I did not send you all because I thought people would be like, oh my God, he wants us to read this before the meeting. And I didn't want to do that to everybody. So Elizabeth, take it over. Thanks, Aton. Um, so um, as Aton mentioned, Tyler isn't able to be here today. So I will try to um, embody him as much as I can as I'm going over this. Um, but I'm sure you know this will be an ongoing conversation and a document that continues to be added to. Um, and expanded upon in future meetings um, and such. So I, I will start off by saying, I do think the comments you just made, Aton, about um, data and Monica's discussion on, we're always gonna have to talk a little bit of data is, is relevant for the JJ portion. Um, I did not put in a large pieces of data into the document that was sent out to you this morning. Um, however, I can. I'm happy to go through and add more into that on data that we have. Um, even if there are certain issues with the data, I'll be, I'll be clear with that on arrest, diversion, um, pretrial detention, et cetera. Um, and the other piece I want to make clear is I'm as I'm looking at the document, I'm realizing some of there aren't unnecessarily links to all of the reports themselves. So I'll make sure that that's updated so everybody can um, read in detail all of the pieces that we reviewed on. Uh, but Tyler and I mainly focused on JJ and we understand the link between JJ and child welfare, um, but we did mainly focus on the juvenile justice side of things given our um, main charge um, within RDAP. So if it's okay, Aton, do you think it'd be best if I just share my screen and go through the additions? I okay. think it'd be lovely. Do I know how to help you do that? Well, I, I'm, I'm pretty used to sharing in Teams, so I, sh I should be set. So just give me one second. God bless. <laughs> it's the benefit of being a, a state employee, right? <laughs> Okay, um, so does everybody see my screen? Yeah, that's okay. exciting. So uh, what we did is we actually just added right into the original document, um, JJ aspects of it. So um, just for the sake of everybody's ease, we, we highlighted the sections we added in blue. So if you're trying to scroll through and look at what was added in, that's the easiest way to see it. I think going forward, we can probably all change it to the right 
the right um, black font, but just so you guys could easily scroll and see. So um, the biggest aspect and the biggest report that we added in here is a report that I actually put together um, that is submitted to the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention annually. Um, they require um, as part of the Juvenile Justice Reform Act, uh, which DCF receives a formula grant every, mm -hmm. theoretically, we're supposed to receive a formula grant every annual year um, that requires us to monitor um, and create a plan to address disparities in the juvenile justice system. Um, I think that that's pretty surprising to people to hear. Um, and it's been in federal law since 1988, which means the feds have acknowledged these disparities um, in the system and have charged states to utilize federal dollars to come up with programming to address these disparities for decades. Um, so that's always something that I want people to be aware of. Um, and we might, you know, the federal government might not be as um, progressive when it comes to adults, but they have for decades um, been aware of it for youth. So this report that I'm referring to includes all of that arrest uh, data, diversion data, et cetera, that I was just referring to. Um, the There is a state advisory group that is made up of members who are appointed by the governor um, that create a plan based on that data. Um, and they utilize the federal dollars in order to create programs um, in attempts to address all of those disparities. Um, the feds give us pretty wide overarching um, ability to focus on what they believe is important. Um, and it's made up of, especially our ethnic and racial disparity committee is made up of um, mainly community members in the Chittenden County area. So this first piece is added in to the section on, I'll just scroll up, on um, diversion and pre-child services. Um, and it's related to some work that that state advisory group has implemented um, based on some of that diversion data. So they are currently funding and promoting statewide restorative justice training of law enforcement focused on juvenile justice. Um, so this is a program that they are in the, the infancy of. Um, they posted an RFP, I believe last summer, um, that was awarded to Burlington Community Justice Center. Um, and they are in concert with um, some other contractors um, about to start doing statewide training on the benefits of pre-charge restorative justice for youth uh, with a highlight on anti-racism and the disparities of access to pre-charge for youth of color. Um, and this is based on a lot of data that we have seen um, nationally and in Vermont that shows that youth of color are not referred to diversion as the same, at the same rates as their white counterparts. Um, and that program, they are first piloting it regionally with law enforcement and state's attorneys. Um, and hopefully we will see this summer um, that really filter out. They have not quite done their first training yet. Okay. So would you, do you think it would be beneficial maybe if I pause for questions before going on to the next section? Or sure, sure. Yeah. Questions, folks? Sheila had one, but it's been answered already. Rebecca. Uh, Elizabeth, I know you and I have been going back and forth earlier today on these reports that you're referencing that you that DCF submits annually to the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention on those five data points that I put in the chat. And you talked about the disparities. You said that there are disparities that show on all five of those data collection points, and they're pretty substantial. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. What also I didn't hear, but I just want to make sure this group hears because we'll get these reports hyperlinked into the memo later so everyone can see them. Mm -hmm. That the most current reporting year is for which year and that there are similar numbers for the past how many years? Like, is this an aberration or is this something that we see year and year and year? In yeah. Year? This is something we see consistently year after year after year. The feds, of course, are a little bit behind on everything. So um, 
for instance, they just posted last week our most recent solicitation. Um, so I will be working on a report that is due this fall um, for this past federal fiscal year. So the one that is currently public, the most up-to-date one that everybody can access is for federal fiscal year 2020. Um, and that, like I said, I'll be working on federal fiscal year 2021 because um, they're they're, they're behind the eight ball. It takes them a little bit to get to it. Um, and to be fair, it also takes um, it takes some time to gather, you know, the data from the courts and the data from um, arrest rates, et cetera, and to put all of that together. The report does look at a um, overview of three years to try for a variety of different reasons. One, um, regarding our small population, uh, with our small population, small discrepancies can can create large impacts um, with the number of youth that we are looking at. Um, and then two, also to deal with that year to year consistency of what we see the data. Um, and, and I will be absolutely clear in, in every um, contact point, that's what the uh, or discretion point, that's what the federal government refers to these as, there are high disparity rates in every single one of them. Um, for instance, um, arrest rates are significantly higher for um, youth of color. For instance, um, Burlington Police Department sends me their individual arrest data for all youth who are under the age of 25. Um, and they 46% of their youth arrests are black youth. Um, and as we know, that is nowhere close to what the population of black youth is in the Burlington area. Um, and, and it's, it's. I, I just wanna make that really clear. Every single contact point, um, when Woodside was up and running, we had about 18% of the Woodside population were intakes that were youth of color. Um, that obviously is not our statewide um, population of youth of color. Um, so we, we see this throughout the entire system. Um, it's interesting, the federal government really cares about secure detention. So um, given our current um, status, our system of care status within DCF and our lack of secure facility options, um, it does screw the data up a little bit because um, we currently do not have a secure facility within the state of Vermont. Does that help I answer some of your questions? And I'm also I, I'm also happy to go through that report and that data. I can do that now, or I can also do that at another RDAP time as well, if we want to really set aside some time to 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 chew through it. I let's get these questions for um Aaron, why don't you go first? Thanks. Um Elizabeth, I'm just wondering about the trainings that law enforcement will be getting. Who exactly is law enforcement? Does that include state's attorneys as well? Um, and will any trainings be open to the public? So it is for um, law enforcement in the broader sense. So it does include state's attorneys. They are not available to the broader public. However, they are specifically for law enforcement. Um, there was a lot of back and forth on how best to reach law enforcement. Um, and law enforcement is involved in the training. So they do have uh, law enforcement officers who are part of that uh, localized to the region. Okay. Rebecca, did you take your hand down? I, I did only only because okay. I, my only comment though is, is I do think those, the data, Elizabeth, that you, you guys are, are sharing year in, year out, um, is remarkable, striking, difficult for me to accept and get my head around. But I do th would rec I would recommend we do land on it with more focus time at some near point in the future. Um, but I just want to make sure people had knew about it at least. Yeah, I appreciate okay. that, Rebecca. Um, and I would definitely I would be happy to do that. Um, and I would agree. I um, I do think we should we would need some substantial time and I don't want to rush through it because I do think it does take some time to conceptualize okay. also the federal, some of the federal definitions of arrest and what the feds mean by diversion. So exactly what we're tracking and what the feds care about um, and then um, applying it to Vermont. Um, it can be a lot of information to, to take in and, and to try to um, kind of internalize and I don't want to rush through for, um, especially for if there's members on the call who aren't um, as ingrained into the justice system and know some of the um, lingo. 
So then I'll, um, what I'll do is I'll just make up. I already have an agenda item for next month. OK, great. Evan. Just a quick question, Elizabeth, that that training that you said was going to be open to uh, state's attorneys, is that is that talking about the training referenced in this this second hollow bullet point there from the BCJC? Yes, yeah. exactly. And is that yeah. is that going to be something that will be? Um, well, do you, I guess, do you know what the timing of that is and whether or not that's going to be available uh, remotely so that deputy state's attorneys and state's attorneys in other parts of the state would be able to attend if their schedule's permitted? Yeah, so they're actually trying to figure that out right now. Um, as you can imagine, um, they're trying to pilot it in two different areas and, you know, trying to get a time where they can get law enforcement obviously is, is tricky, right? Like, you know, so I think they're, they've they landed on doing it on like on a Saturday morning because that's the easiest for a shift change, um, et cetera. I do not believe they're doing a virtual option uh, for a multitude of reasons um, about how they're trying to engage um, the law enforcement officers on restorative justice, but I'm also happy to connect you with um, Mark Weinberg um, and Rachel Jolly, who are the leads on that training, um, and and make sure you're up to date and and aware of all of that. Because I, I Evan, not to not to put you on the spot, but um, if you can, you know, encourage those in the region who are doing that training to attend and participate, I think that would be really valuable. Yeah, no, I'm I'm happy to do that. I didn't realize that you were talking about a, a training that Mark was putting on. He reached out to us. Boy, I don't know. Time is playing tricky things right now. I want to say maybe like four to six weeks ago or something like that. And he had a conversation with John Campbell and I in which he mentioned this training. Um, and we said, great, you know, fantastic. But um, he didn't have many details on the on the timing of it. Um, so. Yeah, so that was that was exactly what this training is. Mark is one of the Got contractors it. who's one of the the main leads on this training. Um, it's just funded through this state advisory group and the federal money. Um, so I'm glad to, I I have you know Mark is is fantastic. So um, I'm glad to hear he's already reached out to you and had that connection. My understanding is the time is very flexible because they're trying to find a time that's best for states attorneys and law enforcement. So it 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 changes based on what and when. Um, those those members can can attend. Okay, uh, Jay, and then Jennifer Pullman. Um, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say uh, there was a comment in the chat asking if you could just repeat the percentage of I believe it was youth of color who were arrested by Burlington Police Department. Was that thirty six or forty six percent? Yeah, it was forty six percent over a three year period. So that's looking okay, at a three year period of time from federal fiscal year 2018 to 2020. Um, thank you. And I just had a question because I'm sort of new to the, the criminal justice and juvenile justice space. Uh, you mentioned a facility named Woodside, is that correct? Um, I would just appreciate some context there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Woodside uh, Rehabilitation Center was um, our former only secure juvenile facility in the state of Vermont um, that DCF utilized for placement of um, delinquent youth um, and youth who were accused of delinquent um, charges. Um, that facility closed in October of 2020. Um, and we have been uh, utilizing a variety of other options um, since that closed. Okay, Jennifer, do you, do you still want do you still have a question? Jennifer Pullman. I don't have a question. I just put it in the chat. Um, I'm actually oh, okay. meeting Never with mind. Mark tomorrow, so I'm happy to just forward the pieces that I heard uh, to him in terms of moving that forward. So thank you. Great. All right. Anything else from anyone? There's a question in the chat before we leave the subject. Oh, uh, all right. I'm sorry, folks. I'm trying to keep up. Ching has a question. What was the reason for closing of Woodside, I'm assuming? 
Yeah, yeah, so there are a variety of reasons for closing Woodside. Um, one, low utilization. Two, to be quite frank, there were quite a few federal lawsuits coming out of Woodside Rehabilitation Center for very good reasons. Um, and for for those two main reasons, um, the, the facility was closed. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, so Elizabeth, we'll do a longer breakout since it really, as it sounds, you feel like we aren't going to have the time with everything else we have to do. Um, we'll do that next time. Okay, I, I can keep going through this report, though, um, if that works. Please. Do, okay, great. Um, so I'll scroll down to, this is um, right in the section of education, um, uh, another uh, project that is stemming from the same state advisory group based on the same results that they review on that data that's submitted to OJJDP is recommendations regarding education. Um, there is a very clear link between um, school discipline and the juvenile justice system um, and the school to prison pipeline, um, even though perhaps utilizing the phrase school to prison pipeline isn't quite as applicable in Vermont because we do not necessarily have a juvenile detention facility, but the link between involvement and the justice system is very clearly still there. Um, so two current projects and work that they are approaching on is um, really to integrate restorative justice within school discipline and to keep the justice system out of schools as much as possible. So they currently, after an RFP process, are funding both Burlington School District and Spectrum Youth and Family Services um, funds to address these issues. Uh, Spectrum is implementing their work within Winooski High School, um, and then Burlington School District is mainly focusing on two of their middle schools. Um, and, you know, they're in adjacent towns in Chittenden County, and given the high arrest rates that we see in that area, um, the State Advisory Group thinks it's really important to be focusing on those two areas of work. Um, it's, it's interesting because, and I'm happy to share um, any reports and information from those two schools, we're about year and a half, almost two years into those programming, and, this, and the State Advisory Group is continuing to fund both of those entities as long as funding um, allows. So their, their work is nowhere close to being done. Uh, Burlington School District is doing a variety of different, you know, positive behavior intervention and supports work, um, and Spectrum Youth and Family Services does a variety um, of different but similarly oriented work within the school district to reduce disparities. Um, I'm happy to, to provide any more information on either of those programs. Um, I will say the overarching goal is to reduce disparities within their school discipline, expulsion, suspension, et cetera. That data has been very skewy since the start of this because a few months after they started funding these programs, COVID hit, right? So mm -hmm. suspensions, expulsions look very, and looked very different during our COVID time period. Um, so that's something that the State Advisory Group is is looking on pretty closely, especially now that um, I'm knocking on wood over here, we're moving out of a COVID time period for our school system. Um, but the overall recommendation from the SAG regarding education is to um, implement restorative justice practices within school discipline instead of more punitive ones. If there aren't questions, I don't see anything in the chat. Um, and I also know we're at 6.45, so I'll keep going. But if anybody has anything, please put it in the chat and I can always come back. So these are some other recommendations um, from this same state advisory group. I know I keep bringing it up, but um, since they do have federal dollars that they can utilize to uh, really work on this issue. They obviously are pretty relevant um, in this document. Um, so they um, would, these are programs that they have not yet funded. OJJDP actually put a hold on Title II funding for every single state in the nation um, and for, for a variety of reasons that I won't go into right now. So we've had a delay in our dollars. Um, we are hoping to receive two years worth of funding this fall though. So hopefully that'll reinvigorate some of these other programs and, and projects that they're looking to work on. Um, 
The first is regarding workforce development, specifically for youth from marginalized communities. Uh, this includes assisting juveniles in making the transition to the world of work and self-sufficiency. A lot of people on the state of advice, state advisory group feel that uh, there are a lot of youth who are um, having a variety of different issues within their schools because they um, need to work to support their families um, and that has a negative impact um, on their involvement in the justice system and their school discipline overall and truancy issues etc um, they are um, also advocating to promote raising the baseline age of juvenile court jurisdiction um, they are working to um, hopefully fund and promote anti-racism training for stakeholders in the broader juvenile justice system. So that might include education, youth mental health service, et cetera. Um, this, I believe we discussed um, last, um, issues of unknown and not reported race and ethnicity data. I know that, um, Evan, you mentioned some, some work that's coming from the Family Rules Committee that was spurred from a letter that um, this state advisory group sent in from Judge Davenport. Um, so Form 101 that law enforcement officers utilize um, has a race and ethnicity area in their form. It's not always filled out. Um, it, and it causes issues in the court database. Um, about 16% consistently of the court uh, database have unknown race, which when we're talking about our population of youth can make a really big impact on how big the disparity actually is. So there's some data here as well um, on the issues with unknown and not reported race or ethnicity. Um, and hopefully uh, we'll see some changes on that. Uh, and then enhancing and developing resources and services within communities that minimize their overall reliance on law enforcement to begin with. Um, and also working with DCF to assess family and community engagement and case planning for youth of color who are involved in the juvenile justice system. So that's an overarching um, review of the work that the state advisory group is doing, although they are involved in some of this information that's included down below. Um, but I'll pause in case there are any questions before moving on to some other work from DCF. Okay, um, so DCF is working to release practice guidance um, for assessing cultural context of the families and youth that we work with. Um, we have not quite finalized that. We've been doing some work with our staff, um, and as, but as soon as it is finalized, I will definitely send it out to this group. Um, it's essentially a guide for assessing the cultural context and practice, uh, both when assessing safety and throughout a case, um, and to learn how culture shapes and influences beliefs and values um, and gives our workers um, more of an ability to set that tone and engage families in that dialogue. Um, this next piece is a report actually from CRG, and I know we have CRG on the line. So if there's anything you guys want to add in, feel free to do so and interrupt me. But this is a report that our state advisory group also funded utilizing federal dollars um, that they wanted to provide a baseline recidivism analysis for youth ages 18 and 19 who were convicted in an adult criminal court. Um, and this was essentially because as as um, some of you may be aware, we have rate we are the first state of the nation to raise the age of original juvenile court jurisdiction to include 18 year olds. Um, and as of July, now that S224 has passed, as of July of next year, we will be including 19 year olds. Um, so given that um, the state advisory group wanted to create a baseline recidivism analysis so we can actually track how we're doing and if that um, change in practice and policy um, has an impact on recidivism rates. Um, one clear um, aspect that CRG found that they noted um, should be looked into in more detail is that 14% of all 18 and 19 year old black youth um, were excluded from the study because they were charged with something that is called a big 12. For those of you who aren't aware, big 12 crimes um, are a, a set of 
crimes that if a youth is charged with it, they are charged in the criminal division. So um, because this was a recidivism analysis that is supposed to review um, the youth who are moving into family court, they, those youth are excluded from the study. Um, by doing so, they CRG real, um, learned that it means that they um, excluded 14% of all 18 and 19 year olds, but only uh, who are black, but only 8% of white youth were excluded for the same research, uh, which is um, creating a disparity or it, it's unveiling a disparity. Um, and they had recommended that further research into this issue um, should be should be looked into and conducted because it's possible that the excluded defendants um, might have had charges when they were younger that would now be processed in juvenile court. Um, but I'll pause because I know we have CRG on the group, but I also know that Robin probably is the one who who would go into a lot of detail on that. Um, so, Evan? Yeah. Um, Evan? Thanks. Oh. Yeah, I, I'm just, I'm having trouble following that last point and, and exactly sort of what it, what it means. And I was just hoping that uh, Elizabeth, either you or someone at CRG might be able to help flush that out a little bit, what it meant to be excluded and what inferences we can or are not supposed to draw. Yeah. So from there's that last bullet point. That um, there are uh, of the black youth who are involved in the justice system, they're more likely to be charged with a big 12 um, or or have maybe not more likely. I will I will retract that exact phrase. They um, more of them have big 12 charges in more of a percentage of the overall black population. Youth black population has big 12 charges than their white counterparts. Um, so they are saying that that is a question mark as to why that is. Um, and where that disparity is coming from. And they are recommending that further research needs to happen in order to go into why we see that difference. Um, they did make it really clear as a statistically significant difference in their research. Um, but perhaps for our next meeting, we can ask Robin to talk about it a little bit more for this group too. Yeah, that, that'd be great. And so so the, does that, when, when this says that they were excluded from the study, does that mean that individuals, regardless of their race, who were charged with Big 12 crimes, uh, the study did not take a look at what their recidivism was? Is that what that means? Exactly. And the reason uh, why that's how this study was conducted was because it was supposed to create a baseline recidivism analysis of the youth that will be coming or already are now for 18 year olds uh, in the system. So it's to basically try to evaluate 201, try to see if 201 actually has an impact on reducing recidivism rates, um, which based on the brain development, um, adolescent brain development, that is the theory. It's that um, youth are better served in the family division for a variety of reasons, including their um, recidivism, their likelihood to um, commit another crime. So, yeah, so they so were this, excluded. This this study doesn't answer that question, though. It establishes the baseline to answer that question at a future date. Am I following? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So the state advisory group will most likely, unless somebody else wants to pay for it, I guess, uh, will conduct another recidivism analysis like five years down the line, maybe later, depending on what happens with 19 year olds. Right. Because you do need I think you need like five years. I you know, this is a Robin question for the exact report um, in, in order to look at all of those youth and if they actually recidivate. Right. So further down the line, we'll be able to look at the 18 and 19 year olds who are now in family and see. Did they is their likelihood to recidivate lower? Um, does that answer everybody's questions? Okay. And, yeah. and if I can just if I can just jump in, I'm I, I just want to say I've got nothing to add. Uh, Elizabeth did a great job, and with Evan's question that he he surmised correctly in his conclusion, and absolutely the most important thing that uh, Elizabeth spoke to was 
bringing Robin in to discuss the specifics. The only thing I would offer up that I know we had in internal discussions um, that Elizabeth did not mention, which, um, you know, is is really a function for this group and the policymakers to decide is what definition of recidivism will be used into the future. And I see Elizabeth nodding. So go run with it. You you clearly understand what I'm talking about. So go, Elizabeth. Yeah, uh, the recidivism, you know, definition and statute is, as as I think CRG told us, is pretty useless. Um, so, and I'm sure many of you guys know that. Um, so, you know, the state advisory group did kind of have a conversation about, uh, I think there were three different versions of recidivism. Um, and to answer the question that's in the um, chat, CRG's contract with us actually ends at the end of this month. So I believe we should be able to release kind of the final report and I can make sure that that is sent out to everybody. And I do believe um, the legislature has asked to see it as well. So it'll be sent to them and, and should be public to everybody. And then we have a question from Monica. I was just gonna make a comment on the recidivism. So it, it was developed several years ago, the methodology and put into statute that um, Elizabeth's got reference here. And it really was developed primarily for the adult system. Um, and and it was developed because Vermont is a unified correction system and it was a way to separate out jail and prison and be able technically to, to compare us to other states. But nobody nobody does recidivism calculations the same across the state anyway. Um, but the Department of Corrections has to produce the recidivism report based on that statute for adults. Um, Robin and I have this conversation all the time. <laughs> so I I, pre, I can feel the pain there. Yes, yes, yeah. We, we yeah. And you can see here in this bullet um, that, that, you know, CRG said it is essentially not possible because there were only two defendants who had been sentenced to more than one year in jail. Um, and were and they were simply just not eligible to recidivate um, until after the data for the study was collected. So um, take with that what you will. Um, and I'm sure I'm sure Robin can go into more detail next month if she's available to join us. Okay, great. Chris. Yeah, and the last thing, just as a this is more housekeeping than anything else. Um, uh, we've had this discussion internally, and both Dr. Joy, Robin, and Karen have been very clear uh, in educating me, so I'm just passing it on, that this report belongs to DCF. So um, in order to you know, get the information, Elizabeth and DCF uh, will be the ones to release it. So if anyone's on the call here wanting to, wanting to see that, uh, the response you'll get is, hey, we were just the research partner and DCF owns the study. So I'm just going to reiterate that because I've been told that a number of times by two women who are much smarter than I. <laughs> Thanks for that, Chris, I appreciate it. But I, I think the, the answer will be is that you can send it to anybody who asks. I, I, I certainly don't want to be holding back any data from the public in any way. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm just going to scroll to the next section. I know I'm trying to keep an eye on the time. I know there's two more people after me. Um, so DCF does have a statewide racial equity work group um, that we created in 2020. Um, and they've got a variety of different work. I actually co-chair that work group along with one of our district staff members. Um, so there's five different subcommittees on a variety of different issues within DCF. But in this report here, I've put in um, some work that's happening specifically related to the juvenile justice portion of work, and that has to do with YAZI. Um, so for members who are not familiar with YAZI, um, it is an evidence-based risk and needs assessment and case planning tool that we utilize um, to ensure that youth one, leave, receive a level of services that's appropriate to their um, each individual youth's risk of recidivism. So it does, does a variety of different things, um, but it measures essentially both risk and the strength um, of each of the youth. Um, it, it does 
pre-screening um, in addition to a full screen um, and is utilized in a variety of different ways. Um, if those of you have questions on exactly how YASI is implemented and, and how those, um, how our DCF workers and BARGE um, utilize YASI um, and, and how it's conducted, I'm happy to bring Lindy in. Lindy Boudreaux is our juvenile justice director and our main point of contact when it comes to YASI. And she is very, very well experted on, on the intricacies of YASI. But for purposes of this conversation, um, there are some really specific um, consequences with um, that we have realized about racial disparities and utilizing Yazi. I did hear, I don't see your faces, but I heard something. So I'm gonna pause. Sheila has her hand up. Um, I'll wait, it, cause it's not related to this directly. I'll wait until you're finished with um, what you're saying because it was an overall general question. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so one thing, um, we looked at Yazi data based on race of, of you, every single youth who has ever taken Yazi in the state of Vermont. Um, and we noted that the legal risk of black youth is higher than their white counterparts. Um, and that is stemming from their criminal history. Um, and they have the same, appro approximately the same um, overall risk and overall strength um, uh, rating. Um, but what is happening is because the legal risk of these black youth is higher than their white counterparts, it results in a larger percentage of black youth being rated as high risk in comparison to white youth. So what does that mean, right? So um, there, the Yazi rates each individual is high risk, medium risk, and low risk. And that is comes into consideration in a variety of different ways um, regarding placement um, and their probation and recommendations that are stemming from DCF. Um, so that can have a pretty large impact on how these youth are treated in our justice system. So um, not to bring in our state advisory group again, but our state advisory group has been willing to utilize some of their federal dollars to do a um, extensive series of analysis on YASI um, and to do to look at gender and race um, and attempt to reduce these disparities by changing the scoring weights and cutoff points that cause certain youth to be categorized as high or medium or low. Um, and the reason why we are um, beginning to approach this project is because DCF connected with New York State, which also utilizes Yazi, and they had similar issues with the tool. They had a higher percentage of black youth who were being categorized as high risk because of their legal history. Now we know that communities of color are over-policed um, and more likely to, um, to be caught doing something or to be pulled over um, than their white counterparts. And it doesn't necessarily mean um, that they actually have a higher risk than their white counterparts. Um, so they were able to change off their change their cutoff points um, and to decrease the overarching number of youth who are categorized as high youth um, and in essentially increase how many youth are medium risk um, and that decrease their racial disparities. So uh, we are currently white right now working on that contract with Orbis. Orbis is the entity that owns Yazi. Um, so they're the ones who have to complete this, uh, this analysis. So we are at the very, very beginning of this process and that contract has not been finalized. Okay. But I'm going to pause because I know that Yazi can be a lot. Um, and I want to make sure there aren't any questions. Doesn't seem to be. Okay. Um, Sheila still has her general question. Okay. Sheila, are you okay with me going into um, the UVM legislative report drivers of custody? Or would you like to ask your more general question? I'll just ask my general question now, if that's okay. Yeah. And then you yeah. can decide whether to answer at the end or not. And I apologize 
if I miss this or if I'm not retaining this, I'm trying to, you know, um, take in all that is being said and process it all. And it's a lot of information. And so um, my overall general question is, I'm curious of what is um, mandated of you all with regards to the things, initiatives, projects um, that you're involved in or engaged in, like all of these things, what is being like mandated and what is the recommendation of other committees and what is stuff that you've all sort of worked on yourselves? And I'm wondering if there's like a cheat sheet of that for people to understand, okay, this is mandated either by the feds or by the state or whatever it is. This is what we need to be in compliance because my other question with that is, is that there's been a few questions around, well, why did this happen with Woodside and why did this happen? And so I know that isn't necessarily the focus, but it helps inform us of the transparency and accountability within the system of DCF and understanding that are there things that were mandated and they weren't fulfilled legally. And that's why some of these things are either shifting or changing or required of DCF. And so I'm just wondering around that transparency around the different things that you're talking about, whether they're, um, again, been mandated, what's sort of the timeline of, of these initiatives. And again, if I'm missing that kind of information or if it's all over the place and I'm not missing it, but it's in different spots, I, I apologize, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious about those things. No, I think that's wonderful. And I'm happy also to follow up. I, I swear I have a cheat sheet regarding ERD. That's well, the federal government refers it to refers to it as RED, racial and ethnic disparities, but we know that that acronym um, uh, has um, some racial um, connotations to it. So Vermont refers to it as ERD, ethnic and racial disparities. Um, and I'm happy to, to send an overview. So I know, you know, it's a lot of information to hear and, and needing to read it is really important. Um, but the federal government requires DCF um, if we uh, to perform these activities essentially to address racial disparities in the juvenile justice system as long as we continue to receive and um, receive this formula grant. Um, if we were to choose to no longer apply for that solicitation, theoretically, we would be saying, nope, we don't want the money. We don't have to do this. Um, and that's pretty typical um, with the feds. They'll they'll link requirements and mandates to federal dollars. Um, so essentially what just the, the, the kind of dirty overview is that DCF, by accepting these dollars, is saying that they will, one, gather this information. Now it's a little difficult because if you've noticed, arrest and you know diversion data and um, court data, et cetera, is not actually owned by DCF. So most of the data we submit to OJJDP is via me gathering all of this information from our partners um, and then aggregating it and submitting it to OJJDP. And I'm not a I'm not a statistician. So I have to admit I'm very happy and excited about this future um, division of racial justice statistics that I'm hoping might be able to help gather this data for this federal report. I'm seeing Aton shaking his head yes. So I'm, I'm very excited about it because uh, I think it'll make my life a lot easier because there'll be one agency that theoretically has this data. But right. we're required to report this annually in our solicitation. Um, and then when we receive the dollars, we are required to utilize at least a portion of the funds uh, because the state advisory group does work on other juvenile justice system improvement areas on reducing these disparities. The feds don't necessarily say, hey, if you have a horrifically high rate of um, youth who are arrested, black youth who are arrested in Burlington, you don't, they're not saying that we have to focus on the area that has the highest disparity rate. They let the state advisory group decide based on the data what they want to focus on. Essentially, what the feds want to see is that we are um, doing something. Um, and the state advisory group mainly has to be made up of non-state employees. So that is um, a really key piece to it as well, um, because they don't want the state agency, not just DCF, but other state employees to be um, really in charge of what and how we're going to address those disparities. Um, and they're the supervisory group, which means they have full authority over the dollars. DCF can't decide to do something with those funds without that group approving it. 
does that help kind of clarify? And then I can follow up with an overview too. Um, yes, it, it, it's helpful. And I think that what would be really helpful is having that blurb before your report. Um, so people really understand what is um, mandated and then what is where things come from and what things are, I think would be really helpful as people are looking at this information. Yeah, I'm happy to, to send that out along with the, the full data too. Before we go over it on in um, July. Okay. Okay, so um, this next piece um, is is not just involving the JJ system. You know, custody rates obviously include child welfare and juvenile justice. So I, I, but I did think it would be remiss to not include this report. So this was a UVM legislative report um, that was um, submitted, I believe this past fall, uh, that had a variety of different recommendations, not just for DCF, also for the courts, also for um, other entities that are involved in the system. But essentially, um, it, uh, one of the most relevant topics in to RDAP um, is it made it really clear that between the years of 2005 and 2018, um, Black or African American children were more likely um, than other children to enter custody. Um, that is the the you know dirty overview of what this is. They had some recommendations for us to minimize our decision making bias. Uh, this is directly from that uh, report. This is this is public and I'll I'll put this right into the chat as well. For those of you who are interested, it was submitted to the legislature. Um, some of the recommendations I have to admit I have some issues with. Um, but they are right down here. They want us to be embedding training on decision making, um, bias and new employee onboarding. They want us to implement blind team decision making. Uh, that is the recommendation that I know are, we have a contractor here at FSD that works with us specifically with our racial equity work. Um, and she, when she saw this, she was like, she she went on high alert and she said, please do not do this. This has been shown to actually have really harmful impacts. You know, ignoring a youth's race um, can be incredibly harmful. Um, so I, I do want to just preface this. Um, and I, I will, as my role as co-chair of that group, continue to advocate that DCF should not implement that because of it. Um, uh, the third recommendation is that they believe we should be promoting um, a culture of data informed practice by FSD in the courts. Um, and then they want us to um, engage the media to explain the impact of the sensationalized high profile cases. Uh, we see really common in the child welfare side of things when there is a, a death or something that really atrocious happens that is publicly reported on in the media, we will see a swing in um, custody and a swing in how our workers approach cases that are similar. And this is a phenomenon that happens not just in, it is a phenomenon that happens na nationally in the child welfare system. Um, and it, and it, you know, our, our social workers are, are human and, and react to the atmosphere that they are in. Um, I do just want to preface this and I apologize because I realized I didn't say why this study was conducted to begin with, and that is that Vermont has significantly higher rates of custody than other um, than other nations. I don't remember off the top of my head, but I think we're like number five in the nation for our percent of youth who are in custody in proportion to our population. So that is the end of my report. Um, and I know I just threw a lot of information out there, but I also know we're at 715. Um, but I see Evan. Yeah, I just I just had a quick question about that last study, um, the UVM legislative report. I, I, I think I'm following along correctly, um, but it but I could be wrong. It it, it sounds like that's talking about um, children who are taken into custody in Chin's cases as opposed to uh, juveniles and young adults who are placed under the state's custody as part of a delinquency or a youthful offender case. Am I am I following that correctly? 
Yeah, you absolutely are. Um, we, you know, Tyler and I went back and forth on whether or not to include this, but, um, you know, there is obviously a link between child welfare and the JJ system. And uh, Sheila, not to put you on the spot, but I know you mentioned it a lot, especially in this group. So we thought it'd be really remiss to not include this, um, especially since it is such a recent report and DCF is in, is in the process of going through it. But yes, this information is way more relevant to our child welfare than our JJ system. But it just shows that, you know, these disparities are within all aspects. It's not just, hey, these are the JJ kids. We should only be focusing on them. And to be to be frank, you know, we see youth in, we'll see the same kid in both aspects of the system um, and we'll engage. So there are huge ramifications. And uh, I, I see that the chat warrants uh, an apology for using an acronym that maybe not everyone is familiar with, but Oh, Rebecca beat me to the punch. Yeah, ch 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 children in need of care and supervision. It's uh, not necessarily when the ch when the child engaged in any wrongdoing where they need to be held responsible or found culpable. It's when, well, as the name indicates, they need they need assistance, uh, or their parents need assistance in making sure that they have all of the sufficient care and supervision that they need. Rebecca. Elizabeth, I wanted to thank you for adding all of this information to this memo. Um, and uh, and we should clarify, I think, in that UVM legislative report in the writing that custody is, I mean, I don't know what your percentage breakdown would be when you talk about custody. I mean, I think of custody, family division, DCF as 90% chins, child welfare, 10% or less, juvenile justice, right? And so as Evan's point is, and it is important, like I like that you brought it in, but let's make sure that people reading this outside of this meeting context can know that this is in the context of something different. General comments, uh, but appreciation that you're adding this because I think certainly from my perspective, it has been hard to get reports and access to these. And I mean, the little details here, like the New York Yazi realization of lowering cutoff points has a direct impact on, on lessening disparities. I mean, to the extent that you can share those kinds of reports, if they're public from New York, I'd love to hyperlink it to this, right? Just because this is such a gift of that's what we're building here on top of what, as sort of focusing our direction of where we go to next. My comment though, pulling back in terms of what you're sharing on the substantive level, knowing that and looking forward to sort of a deeper dive on the OJJDP annual report on uh, disparities um, on those five data points for juvenile justice. Um, I'd like, because I see, well, I was reading the recommendations um, closely and I think it struck me, particularly when I, and I know people here haven't read those reports, but when you read those reports um, and see the data and, 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 and sort of what you write up, DCF writes up in response to those in those reports, it strikes me that hey, we should make sure we understand and land on what the problem is so that we can then make appropriate recommendations to fix those problems. Because my overall comment here is that the recommendations that I see here don't address what I think is the problem which is that we have uh, an issue on disparities on enforcement um, towards youth of color in Vermont and in particular counties, right? Uh, disparate treatment of youth of color at the enforcement side and at the sentencing or, or custody side. And, and when we talk about this and you talk about this, we focus on juvenile justice being family courts, but what this reporting is showing is also how youth of color are landing in our adult criminal courts at a disparate rate from white youth. And so when we think about recommendations, how we can focus on those categories straddling these two systems, right? So I'd hope that next time we're around when you come and talk, uh, a, we can think about landing on what the problem is so we can then focus on what the recommendation should be to address those. Yeah, Rebecca, it's so funny you bring that up. Um, so, I, and I can go into so much more detail on this next month as well. Um, you know, as I mentioned to Sheila with her question about like, what are we required to do from the feds? Um, and I said that, you know, the feds give the state advisory group really complete authority over to decide how they want to approach addressing those disparities. And his, 
as long as I have been involved in, you know, you know, I'm not a, I'm not an appointed member. I support their, I support the group. I'm the admin for, for the state advisory group, um, and try to make, make what they want to do come to reality is they like to focus on more prevention than enforcement and law enforcement. And, um, for probably for a, a variety of different reasons, but I think that that is incredibly important to discuss in terms of RDAP. And um, especially if we're thinking about, okay, what are other groups doing and what do what does RDAP want to do going forward that is not being duplicative? And, um, and, and if RDAP wants to make recommendations to the state advisory group, I think that would be appropriate. I think there's a lot of different things that we could think about doing. Um, in in engaging um, that work. Um, so I, I'm actually really excited that you bring that up because that's something that um, I discuss with them pretty frequently about, okay, how are you going to actually reduce this rate? And do you actually think that this project is going to do that? Or is it gonna take 10 years because you're approaching it through the school system? And while that is incredibly important, it's also important to make sure that the youth who are currently in the system are not left hanging, that we're not only focusing on prevention, that we're focusing on prevention mm -hmm. and so it's a conversation that is continuous and I have um, frequently and I'm excited to have it with this group. So thank you. Okay. Anything else from anyone? Okay. Elizabeth, thank you. This is exactly what we've been hoping for. I mean, I... I I, I'm certainly not trying to speak for Sheila, but she has been really leading a charge in this group for a long time about including JJ system. And this really goes over the top. It's really lovely to see this level of granularity and detail. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Aton. I do just want to say that I so I actually put this report um, together a few weeks ago, and I am realizing that it doesn't have our most recent um, race data for just entrance and custody. So I'm going to put that in the chat right now as well. Um, and okay. keep in mind, and I want to make it very clear, just as Rebecca said, that this is all youth who are entering custody. So this is JJ and these Chins youth. This is this is encompassing of our entire um overview not just um the jj portion but i will put that right into the chat and that's it's for uh calendar year 2021 great thank you uh, moving in fact backwards um i know that susanna has come in um and i would like i had sort of had a preliminary chat with her about as it says in the agenda, what the RDAP will need to do in Ray facilitating the new division. Um, she has some thoughts on that, things we need to be thinking about. And so I'd like to give the floor to her, Susanna. Great, thank you. Hello, good evening, hi. And um, I am actually very happy when I can be brief and I can be brief here. Um, and Elizabeth, we can still see your share. <laughs> Thank you. I yeah, <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> um, so yes, I can be very brief here. I just wanted to let the panel know that um, we have been thinking about how to streamline our communications with the RDAP and the Division of Racial Justice Statistics. As you know, the Office of Racial Equity currently reports to the Racial Equity Advisory Panel that was created alongside the Executive Director role back in 2018. And with the passage of Act 142, more commonly known to us as H546, uh, we will now be reporting to not only that advisory panel, but also to the RDAP and to the new RJ SAC, Racial Justice Statistics Advisory Council. I'm trying to make that a thing. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> we will now be reporting to three panels and uh, two of you specifically, the RDAP and RJ SAC would be about criminal justice related data. So what I would like to do is just make sure that you all are aware, first of all, that that is going to happen. Um, considering again, we have 
slash appoint three seats on this panel. It feels a little bit weird to be reporting to oneself. Um, but more importantly, I just wanted to know, I, it, it's not clear to me that the RDAP has ever been in a position to be reported to. That is to say, you've never really been people's manager, uh, as far as I can tell. I hope I'm not being um, reductive. But so I just want to know what it is that you all as a team want to see in this kind of reporting. I believe specifically we're supposed to report monthly to you. And also, I think the RJ SAC is also supposed to report to you on our activities. The whole thing is quite confusing, but um, it would be helpful for me to get a sense from you all about what you want that to look like. And I, I think it just took me three minutes to say something that basic, but that's what I'm asking. So we need to spend some time talking about that, about what what we need from the groups that will be reporting to us. Um, I am not convinced everyone has an idea of that because um, I'm sure not everyone's looked at the reporting requirements under Act 142. Um, but if I'm wrong on that and people feel that they're ready to weigh in, please wait on in. Rebecca. Susanna, it's actually questions, more <laughs> questions, because I don't have I don't have answers yet either. But when yeah. are your reporting requirements supposed to begin? Excellent question. Please hold while we connect your call. <laughs> I don't mean to put you under on under, under pressure. I just I'm um <laughs> No, it's all good. Um, just give me one quick second. OK, so this is um, the division. The division is going to report to you on a monthly basis. It does not exactly say when that's supposed to begin. I guess whenever we start yeah. the work. Um, also, we are reporting in January to the legislature. And then I think the advisory council reports to you. And I think I heard somebody is going to jump in there. I was going to jump in. Um, I, I beat uh, Susanna to it because I wasn't talking. Um, I was looking up the bill while she was talking. So um, members of the council, the Racial Justice Statistics Advisory Council, um, shall be appointed on or before November 1st, 2022. Um, so there's a bit of lead time on that. And um, the Racial Justice Statistics Advisory Council um, has to report monthly on its findings to RDAP and uh, on January 15th and 2023 and annually thereafter to the House and Senate committees on the Judiciary and Government Operations. Thank you, Jay. Thanks, Jay. I just typed what you said and put it in chat. So we need to discuss how we want that to look, what that reporting should look like. OK. Um, again, I'm not feeling like that's necessarily a conversation to be had now, but it does mean that everybody needs to really look at the act and really think about what that means. What does that look like? What needs to be reported? In what ways? Those are the big questions that I think need to be answered. Um, and there are a number of different ways of doing it depending on what we're reporting. So give some thought to that, please, because it will come up again um, next month. So Thank I you. would and recommend, I, go ahead. Thanks, Aton. And I just want to clarify also my my ask. I What I don't want is for you all to to tell me what the bill says, um, because that's not your job. That's my job, and, and I need to do that. What I'm really looking for from you is just what level of formality do you want? Like, do you want a one pager every month? Do you want it delivered at your regular RDAP meeting? Should it be separate? Should it be in writing? Should it be just a casual report out from me when we meet? So that's kind of what I'm asking is um, 
how do you want all of this information? Ching? Um, so I think the format probably will depend on what kind of feedback um, you want to have from our dad. Um, so I'm mm -hmm. not sure if that's to be discussed in the future where you actually have some rough idea of what kind of feedback or what are that will serve um, after seeing the report. Anything else? Yeah, that's a great point. I would say um, it's probably a little early to tell only because this is all kind of a new endeavor. I would guesstimate that since um, RDAP generated the initial report and recommendation for this, that I would look closely to you all just for a sense of uh, whether you think that we're on the right track in terms of what data we're chasing. I also, um, one thing that I do like is that when we did this exercise of revisiting all of the past report or recent reports, part of that was to surface topic areas that we may want to consider for further exploration or to revisit. And considering that the data we get from the Division of Racial Justice Statistics is going to point us in the direction of certain upstream factors, that may also be a good point of intersection for the RDAP to consider. Because I remember in our conversations around this, one of the things we said was, well, do, you know, it's criminal justice data, but it very much speaks to broader systemic and institutional problems that arise in housing, education, you name it, right? Elizabeth talked a lot about the pipeline, et cetera. So, um, that also may be part of the feedback, which is help us identify the links that are worth chasing or delegating to sister agencies who have subject matter expertise. Right. And I'm just thinking on, now what I was about to say made no grammatical sense. Um, off the top of my head, I think a certain amount of formality, like a written document, might be a good thing in just in terms of transparency in the same way that the minutes are posted to be able to post those reports as well it seems to me is very important that's just a brief take on that anyway as i say i no one needs an answer right now think on this Read Act 142, think on it. This will come up again next month. Um, recommendations for what that looks like, what's in it, et cetera. All right. Are there questions about that homework? <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Uh, witchy. You uh, can you talk some about what I'm just calling at the moment the community safety review? Sure, I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, Aton, you're you're free to chime in. Um, Great. And I and I know Sheila, you you know a lot of it, so you can also feel free to chime in. So uh, essentially, we all know Brattleboro did a community safety review. They had an implementation table. Um, and um, when we met with the town manager and the chief, it seemed uh, sort of things that stood out was like, you know, this, this report really centered marginalized folks uh, and those who uh, often get, uh, are, whose voices are not heard, which was good. I think some limitations that we're, we're needing to consider is that it, within that implementation, there were some things that were not possible at the town level. Um, or even legal within state or federal uh, guidelines. Uh, and uh, Aton made a really good point of like, our DAP is a, is a state, uh, our focus is the state. So um, while it's nice to be able to look out what's happening specifically in Brattleboro, we wanna broaden it up a little bit to see if there are common themes with other uh, community safety reviews, such as the, that one that happened in Burlington and in other areas. So um, uh, we tried to meet uh, as a follow-up uh, not too long ago and that didn't work out, but I did send a new one to me to try to coordinate that. Um, if, if you haven't responded, uh, let me know. And if you have responded and haven't heard from me, also let me know. Um, yeah, so so that's sort of like where we're going to go. I don't know that there's another step beyond that. 
Uh, so Eitan and Sheila, feel free to uh, chime in um, or we can open it up also. Okay. Sheila, just if you're in, if you want to go, go. She I'm said. Got it. Sorry, it takes me a minute to move. Um, now, we were just, I just had a conversation with Witchy earlier this afternoon where I was saying exactly what he said, that we needed to broaden this out. But those issues that have been being brought up in those reports might well be um, useful. It was frustrating, I think, for a lot of people we weren't able to do the meeting for the subcommittee that we had planned. I suddenly couldn't be there. Somebody else suddenly couldn't be there. But I'm less frustrated about that now because it means we've we've all actually got some more reading to do of these reports from other communities that we can look at and get a sense of what the thinking is in these other places so that this really can be a more statewide um, initiative. That is really about where we're at with that. Um, and if others are interested in that, particularly since it's not just focusing on Brattleboro, um, that ought to be something that you should drop a lot, which is it okay if people drop a line to you, like a, an email? Please. Great, thank you. Um, if you guys are interested, if someone's interested in being on that subcommittee, just wanted to talk a little bit about its reframing, um, that it really is going to be broader than Brattleboro and Wyndham County. Um, and you should drop Witchy a line in case that's something that interests you. All right. Any questions, comment? Oh, Jennifer Pullman's written something. Give me a second. I'm reading. I'm reading. Ah. Jennifer, this goes back to what we were talking about with, with uh, Elizabeth, yes? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. I think that so many times what I hear from advocates who work in the system is that um, victims are basically not treated as seriously based upon um, where they, uh, how they identify and, and their culture and their identity, and they're brushed off and not given the same treatment that they should have been. Um, and that happens definitely in the juvenile justice system. I mean, I've, I've worked in that in Boston, and I know what that looks like for different, um, especially um, young men, um, young black men, and that things were handled differently when it was really a trauma situation versus um, an incarcerative piece. So I just want to think about as we're doing this piece, and I don't know how to gather da the data because we don't, but I just want to think about how we brush off people that present with trauma, present um, differently than how we might expect the traditional victim to look like and how we handle that that piece and how we don't and what are we how are we supporting people so i'm just thinking about are we bringing people back into the system are we turning people away and then creating a system where they become back, you know back involved um so i just want to think about that lens as well because i think that our system does a really poor job right now in terms of really thinking about how we support people who are presenting and looking for help and are not being supported. So just uh, just my thoughts moving forward. I'm not even a person on this actual uh, panel, or but I just wanted to put that piece out there. And I think it's an intersection. I think that people who are victimized come from trauma and then trauma uh, presents itself as um, also people creating harm when perhaps if we'd done something differently, then that wouldn't be the case. So I just wanted to put that lens on it um, from my perspective and just um, grateful to be a part of it. So again, I'm not, I'm not a part of the panel, but just happy to be here to just ask that we think about that as well. Okay, thank you. And we're not snobby about where we got our information. <laughs>
<laughs> no, but it, it's hard because I, I've been thinking about this a lot, but I don't I don't have any data. So I just go by what I'm hearing from advocates who are doing the work is that there's not the same treatment. Right. When there's okay. a report that comes in, there's a pushing off or, a, well, you know, you deal with it. It's not the same treatment. So. And um, again, you all know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir about the intersection between trauma and why people keep coming back into the system, whether it's because they've committed harm or keep suffering harm. So just wanted to say um, again, thank you. And that was my that was my piece that I wrote about. OK, thank you. Sheila. OK, I guess I wanted to say something now. Thanks, Eitan. Um, so I just wanted to let people know that if they are interested in the report, the safety committee report that um, Wichi is talking about, um, if you're interested in community policing, you might be interested in this. If you're looking for alternatives to policing, you might be interesting interest in this. And if you're looking at alternatives to sort of that deconstructing of what safe and safety means, it might be interesting to you this report. Um, this report, I think it's like 264 pages or something. I can't I can't remember, but it's anyway, it's long. And I I I want people to understand that this came not only was this work done, but there's money attached to it to where what came out of this effort is not just the, um, the shifting and changing of the culture of how we do policing or how we think of safety within our community, where we're actually taking dollars to help implement things like that, like taking dollars that we once would maybe um, put to fund the police and putting that into what we're calling, you know, whether it's mutual aid or community policing or trying to figure out what can we do as the community? What have we done as a community to support support each other and being safe. So if you're interested in alternatives to traditional policing and, and interested in how to maybe you could pilot this kind of study in your community, then I definitely um, please reach out to Wichi or if other people have some questions, they can also reach out to me. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Rebecca, are you going to hate me? Uh, no, never. <laughs> <laughs> But can I ask a follow-up question of Wichi and, and and of and course Sheila? Thanks for the for for meeting with those guys and sharing. Um, let me. I try to understand what your are, what are your next proposed moves? Are you exploring sort of these um, similar initiatives in other areas next? Um, That's what I proposed. But well, my understanding, which you can speak if you want, but my understanding is this was a Brattleboro thing because we needed to do a Brattleboro thing. Um, but there is the opportunity to host this all over the state and to create the same thing. The facilitators who took us and guided us and meaning us, the community, through this process were absolutely phenomenal. And if they and they did it at a very, very low rate, but I really recommend either them or somebody doing something similar within their communities. I'm going to do a shameless plug. We found out that the root Social Justice Center was one of the number one places that across the board, no matter how people identified, said that we were a safer place for them and their people and their community. And it came out over and over again, what the community sees as safe, what they consider safe nets, where they consider where they get their resources. It was very enlightening and very interesting. And it really is not only shifting the conversation, but like I said before, it is shifting how we fund things here. And whether that's the actual police department or end or initiatives, or whether that's how we fund our human service or nonprofit organizations that are actually the ones on the ground serving the people to create that safer community. Yeah, I yeah, I agree with Sheila that a lot of great stuff came out of that and really has affected even even you know outside of the root our our, our approaches to to just safety in general. Um and it allowed that kind of information allowed us to push back against some 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 systems that were that were in place that weren't really helpful, but there wasn't really the data to back it up. And we were able to use those narratives, those experiences that that collected um, co a collective narrative to really push back against some things that were already there. Um, I I have thought I have like really big hesitation against trying to replicate that for the whole entire state. Um, 
I think that what we're going to see is it's been different in every town, every county. Um, and I, I, and, you know, I was part of creating the RFP for that and was involved and, and, uh, you know, the people who facilitated it, um, Sheila knows that, that, that I also know them. Um, and honestly, it was like in six months they had to, they worked like, it was crazy amount of hours that they worked and I don't want to repeat that, that process. Um, I think there was a lot of good stuff that came out of it, but I think, um, it might be worth it to, to explore if things are already done or if people are wanting to do that things and seeing how we can support things that are already happening, um, and bringing that information to the state and cr creating themes across these different reviews to be able to report on specific, um, limitations or specific pathways or specific uh, common themes that would be really helpful when we implement state policy. Jennifer. I just want to um, ask uh, Wichi and um, Sheila, is this the RFP, the grant that um, we submitted the center with uh, with Chris Lukasik and uh, Tracy um, on behalf of the project that in Wyndham? No, this is a separate initiative. Okay. All right. Thank you. No, we have um, lots of good boilerplate ready to go. So we worked with um, Christopher and with um, Tracy as well. So just we're happy to help in any way, uh, shape, or form. So thank you Great. for the clarification. But we've got we've got language. Oh. Wait, can I can I get Jennifer? Can I get clarification? Maybe I missed something. Are you saying that you've submitted a proposal to do this kind of review in different places, or no? We did uh, a piece with um, Christopher and Tracy wanted to do the piece with the racial bias um, uh, advocate, and we basically worked with them to submit the earmark request to Leahy and Welch and Sanders. And um, that did not go through, but we oh, have- Oh, for the resource advocate, got it. Yes. Okay, got it, thank you. Okay. Anything else on this particular topic, the, uh, the community safety review and its sort of statewide application? Okay. Again, if you're interested in looking at that, the ways in which it's been handled in other parts of the state, looking at the commonalities, please get in touch with Witchy because he is organizing the next meeting of that group since the first meeting didn't work uh, just because of people's schedules. Okay, now it's time for Rebecca to hate me because the last group <laughs> on the list is the second group so-called subcommittee. And we've got 12 minutes and I don't know what we're gonna be able to do. This is gonna obviously bleed over to next month. Or, you know, if you wanna just wait until then, that's fine. Um, I leave it to you, Rebecca. Uh, well, you know, why don't I take five minutes or less to, to give everyone an update on where that subcommittee, what we did, and maybe some suggestions since um, I doubt we'll have a chance to fully discuss and decide whether we do want to pursue it further. Um, so, okay, going there, uh, the, a, a group of us um, met like a few weeks ago, two weeks ago, on, on exploring the subject generally of what Second Look um is comprised of right and and um and you may recall last time last meeting we talked about how this this recommendations reports memo was short on focusing on addressing people of color who have been already incarcerated who are sitting in jail and not just and while we talked about adult uh, courts, we left open the possibility of exploring this concept on in the juvenile justice side, uh, including family disposition, so not necessarily in adult courts. So second look is a short, short way of saying, let's take a relook at what was previously ordered as a sentence of incarceration. Uh, it's a traditional way of looking at it. And so there are certain um, um, guidelines for when that's done, who, you, who, which populations you're focusing on. So as a subcommittee, we sort of reviewed sort of 
general trends across the country where legislation has already taken place, taken hold. Um, we talked also about where model legislation also should focuses on. We talked about how um, focusing on, and again, the, the premise is to address and correct uh, errors that, that may have um, inadvertently happened at the time of sentencing, could not be corrected at the time of sentencing, or perhaps new information enters the picture all these years later while someone is serving a sentence, uh, new information specific to that, that case. Uh, new information as, as in terms of as as a society uh, policy priorities. Why do we punish and have we changed our attitudes towards it? All sorts of things that allow sort of time to to revisit. Right. Uh, focus has been on focusing on the most serious uh, offenses, longest serving sentences, those serving life imprisonment. Some have focused on age, uh, trying to get to the youth. Uh, recognizing that that youth children at the time of 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 committing the underlying offense warrants special second look, given what we are increasingly knowing about science in the adolescent brain and how criminally responsible um, they should or shouldn't be based on that scientifically more advanced understanding. On and on and on. What we also talked briefly was we're not aware of any second look legislation that is focusing on racial disparities. Right. So we talked about that. We talked about how these laws have objective criteria set up so that try to strip away um, discretionary decision making points along the way from the judges and stuff and and how um, to protect all interested parties in that process. Um, and so we uh, we talked about what Vermont has currently that's remotely close to it. And the bottom line uh, of that reveal was was little to none. Like. We have very little by way of current laws allowing for a review of sentencing. Very short. Uh, we gave a little history of of, of current ref or most recent reform efforts to change it and why they didn't go forward. Uh, we shared how Sentencing Commission, for which I'm a vice chair and Judge Zona here is the chair, has a similar subcommittee looking at the same same issue. We talked about whether or not that would be duplicative. Uh, we talked about whether or not um, there was a role for us to play and then uh, whether or not we should be coordinated. We talked about second look legislation's duplicity in terms of other aspects of our system, like post-conviction relief. So a lot of lot of big legal issues. Where we landed was we want we we as a group and Aaron, you know, and others here who are on it, please speak up. And I think where we landed was we wanted to share that. I think we had learned enough about it. I think we, we before we dive deeper into what we want to do and by way of specific, maybe zeroing in on priorities within those groups, like who do we want to focus on? Youth, youth of color, just youth of color, like what types of offenses, all those types of things. Um, before we land on those details to which we can then sort of reach out to experts with the end game being of recommended proposed legislative language for the session. Um, we also wanted to make sure the panel was interested in us pursuing this further. So that's the nutshell summary. Do you, we've got six minutes left. In terms of that last point that Rebecca raised that the subcommittee was concerned with, pursuing this further and what the panel's feeling is on that. Could we have a little bit of discussion or at least commentary from folks on that? That would be really useful at this moment. I think it's essential, personally. <laughs> Go subcommittee. Just say it like that if you want. <laughs> I agree. I agree. You know, we talk about second. If we don't, if we don't give a second look, then what are we doing here? Because, right. I mean, I, so it's a no-brainer. Yes, we need to be looking into it, and yes, we need to have it be one of our priorities. Got it. Thank you, Sheila. 
Anyone can else? Add, can I add another little piece to Rebecca's excellent nutshell? Because we really did talk for a long time and it was a, a really dynamic and productive conversation. Um, one aspect we talked about is what would this legislation look like and how would it work? Um, and we talked about the possibility of restorative justice principles underlying the, you know, the second look that 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 players in the system embark upon um, so that we're also considering some of these other lenses we've all been talking about tonight. Like, was this person a juvenile at the time? What about the victims? Um, and that restorative justice can present that opportunity to be thinking about this from a holistic perspective. Because if it's if we leave, but let, just as an example, if we if we kind of look at it um, and we leave aside the victims, this is not going to be popular and it's not going to be something that um, communities get on board with and it's not going to be a, a meaningful progressive response. Got it. Thank you, Aaron. Okay. Um, and what I, I think what I just want to say is there are going to be really neat moments of overlap. Aaron was just talking about restorative justice and the second look commit subcommittee. And Elizabeth was talking about that um, with looking at what needs to be done that got left out it, with when we were talking about the juvenile justice system in the 2019 report. What I'm trying to point out is I think there's going to be a lot of overlap. And I think also that there'll be a lot of opportunities for people, even if they're not on a specific subcommittee, to act as critics for that, um, for the other committees, to be able to put other eyes on what it is we do, so that this report actually would be a very fleshed out, fully written thing that would include pros and cons, which I think would be quite useful to the um, legislature. And it is not something we did specifically with the 2019 report. So I just wanted to put that out as another thing that I've been thinking about on my own and then more as I've been listening through the last couple hours. Okay. Um, I'm just being thorough. Is there anything anyone else wants to be putting in? Because we are winding it up. All right. Um, we already know what some of the agenda is going to be for um, next month. Um, it's going to be a continuation on the second look subcommittee. Um, Elizabeth's going to be getting a bunch of documents to us that we're going to be looking at. Um, I would like people to think about the kind and quality of the response that, um, I'm sorry, of the reports that we will be getting from the new division. Um, that's one of Susanna's asks. So if you need to look at Act 142, do remember it is no longer H546. It is Act 142. I love how they do this. It's like, how can we make this as complicated and impossible to follow as possible? And by God, they did it. Yeah. Um, but please look at Act 142 to get some answers to the questions that Susanna brought up. Any new business? Because we just did a lot of new business. <laughs> okay, our next meeting is the 12th of July next month. Um, I will try talking with Robin Joy, see if she can come. Um, since she was one of the people we've just identified as being useful. And on that, does anyone want to start a conversation about, you know, going home or like focusing on home? That was a really weird way of saying, did someone want to make a motion? No. I'll make a move to adjourn the meeting and to say happy Juneteenth to my people and to please donate to black owned organizations and businesses. Thank you, Sheila, for all of that. Thank you. Is that seconded by anyone? Yes, me. <laughs> all in favor.
please signify by saying I and raising your hand. I. I. All opposed and all abstaining. Motion is carried. Everybody have a great month. And a lot of you I'll probably be seeing on subcommittees. So take care. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Be well. Thank you.